Here at Fermilab, we are studying deepest secrets of nature by colliding protons and antiprotons, particles of matter and antimatter, with the highest energy which is accessible to scientists anywhere in the world. The U.S. used to dream big. Big cities, big ideas, big science. In the 20th century, the best scientists in the world came to the United States to do some of the largest, costliest, and most innovative projects in human history. For better or worse, it was technological supremacy that won the Cold War and made America a superpower. Science also took us farther than we'd ever been before and gave us brand new answers to the oldest questions. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. In the 1970s, a cowboy physicist named Robert Wilson came looking for answers on the Illinois prairie. There, he designed and built Fermi National Laboratory, or Fermilab, named after Enrico Fermi, the father of the atomic age. In 1983, Fermilab switched on the biggest and baddest gadget in the world, the Tevatron, a giant underground ring designed to explore the tiniest particles by smashing them into each other at close to the speed of light. Four miles in circumference, this complex machine was large enough to contain a small town and powerful enough to explore the origins of the universe. Just over a decade after it began, the Tevatron made a massive contribution to physics, the discovery of the top quark, the last and heaviest of the elementary particles that make up all matter. America was at the forefront of big science, and Fermilab was the world's outpost on what physics calls the frontier. Next, it would pursue the most elementary particle of all, the one that gives all matter its mass, the Higgs boson. But like everything else, the Tevatron grew older. Soon, the focus of the physics world began to move to Europe, home to a particle accelerator four times larger than the Tevatron, the Large Hadron Collider. By the time we visited Fermilab last year, many scientists had already left for Europe. The one-time center of the physics universe looked more like a ghost town. But the buffalo were still there. I don't know if you want to see the buffalo. We have a small herd of buffalo, probably about two dozen right now, and that's because Robert Wilson, the founding director of the laboratory, you know, it was right after World War II. He didn't want that sort of gray, drab type of look that you see in a lot of laboratories of that time period. He wanted something that was fun, so he wanted to blend science, environment, and art into the laboratory, and he thought this area had been sort of the frontier in America. Buffalo were big on the frontier. We were moving into the frontier of science. So he got this herd and it's become sort of our de facto mascot for the laboratory. And you see a picture of Buffalo in a science magazine, everybody knows it's Fermilab. If you go into our tunnel and you put anything in the way of it, you will die. The radiation that encompasses that beam will kill all your white blood cells. Uh-oh. Humankind, I mean, once it meets the, the basic, any society, once it gets to the level where it meets its basic needs. It can, it can provide food for its members and shelter and, and those sorts of things. The next thing mankind has done is ask the, the simple question, why? Why does the world work the way it does? This fundamental science goes out and tries to answer that question. Welcome all y'all to the Fermilab on the Illinois prairie beneath the bison, the frontier. 
introduce to you is the Higgs at? It's everywhere. The particle was first proposed in 1964 by British theorist Peter Higgs. It's thought to make up an invisible energy field that switched on immediately after the Big Bang. When certain particles pass through this field, the interaction creates mass, which explains why everything we can see, from quarks to stars to bison, exists at all. It was a Fermilab scientist who called this essential ingredient the God particle, or the goddamn particle, because it's been so hard for science to find. To find one, you use giant electromagnets to steer bits of atoms around a ring, an accelerator, so you can crash them into each other, and then look at the wreckage to see what they're made of. The more energy in the beam, the larger the magnets, the more violent the collision, and the more essential the bits of the universe you get to see with your detector. This isn't just a subatomic demolition derby. It's a time machine allowing us to go all the way back to that moment when the universe came into existence. So I'm taking you to the CDF control room where we uh, staff to collect the data and run the detector. It's been occupied around the clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the last 11 years. It's frustrating for me in the sense that people don't automatically see how rich and how close we are to getting to the answer, I think, and, and want to make us, let, allow us to go faster. But by that same token, right, this is a very tough economy, and they haven't cut us like they cut other things. Two decades ago, while scientists at the Tevatron were looking for the top quark, the race to find the Higgs was already ramping up in Texas. In the mid-1980s, the Department of Energy announced it would build the Superconducting Super Collider, a giant new atom smasher outside of Dallas, 52 miles in circumference. But as costs ballooned to over $12 billion, and without clear public interest, Support for the massive project was fading in deficit-weary Washington. In 1993, after vigorous debate by lawmakers, physicists in the US and around the world got what may have been the most devastating memo in science history. After $2 billion in construction, Congress canceled the project, leaving behind miles of empty tunnels that have been gathering water ever since. We've lost our particle edge beginning in the early 90s, of course, when the Superconducting Super Collider got its funding completely canceled, not even curtailed or cut back. And that was the writing on the wall for what was to come in America. The divestment of decades of our investment in the frontier of science, of physics in particular, Many people in my generation were really pulled into particle physics from the excitement and possibilities that there would be a superconducting super collider in this, in this country. And uh, yeah, it was a real blow that in many ways we're, we're still recovering from. You know, following that event, CERN made a big effort to build the Large Hadron Collider. CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, based outside Geneva, would take the lead on the physics frontier. Their 17-mile-long Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, was a fraction of the size and power of what the machine in Texas would have been. But it was far more powerful than the Tevatron, allowing physics its best chance yet to find the Higgs. And then in 2008, Washington announced new cuts to Fermilab's budget by millions of dollars. The following year, CERN would switch on the LHC. Countdown, three, two, Way. one, beam, and there it is. And that was the moment of the full circuit. America's biggest science experiment had never looked more obsolete. 
truly a historic moment. Over the past few years, scientists at the Tevatron have been hunting for the Higgs alongside their counterparts at the LHC. While the LHC was bigger and stronger, the Tevatron had one advantage at the start, time. After it was turned on in 2009, the LHC immediately ran into technical difficulties. Scientists at the old Tevatron saw a chance to take the lead. They argued that if it could stay open for just a few more years, the Tevatron might find the Higgs, if it even exists, and explore other mysteries that challenge the standard model, our best guess for how the universe works. If you talk to theorists, and, and, uh, and I'm not a theorist, I think nobody really believes that the standard model version of a Higgs mechanism will fly. I think they think that there are other uh, Higgs mechanisms out there that are more likely to be the case. But, uh, but the unknown, the unexpected is always more interesting and it, it will open up a whole nother realm depending on uh, what that unknown something is. The country billions, if not trillions of dollars in debt. Yes, this research is important, but why not do it a little further down the road when we have the economic footing? The problem is, once you get out, once you lose your place, and there's other countries, China and other places, that are more than willing to step in, Russia, other things. We've seen it, that when we step out and say, hey, we're just going to take a break, you don't get back in again. You lose that footing, you lose that, and you lose a generation. Science has always had the problem of more ideas than cash. But now, with big concerns over government spending, the argument for big national science projects with bigger and bigger machines will be harder to make. I can't tell you explicitly what the next thing that we're going to discover is and its impact, per se, on, on society 30 years from now. I can look back on other fundamental science research on what I do and, and tell you that it has had tremendous effects on society. You know, anything from GPS to the World Wide Web to accelerators that are used in all sorts of applications, MRIs, the whole, a whole spread of things are, are fallout from, from what we do. Of course, understanding how the universe works doesn't have immediate practical benefits. But some scientists say we should think of this research like a better version of war. It pushes our technology and our understanding to the limits and generates economic growth without any more violence than a particle collision. You know, someone, I forgot who said it, but you know, the Fermilab isn't gonna help you defend the country, but it makes the country worth defending. And, uh, and that's true. Officials at Fermilab couldn't fight Washington's budget cuts. In 2011, they received word that the machine would have to shut down by the end of the year. It's not the best map of the site, but we are right, there's the high rise, so we are right here at this point. In the control room for America's biggest science experiment, the man in charge told us he'd been spending his nights and weekends on a side project, a Star Wars fan film, using his colleagues as actors and Fermilab as his set. I was in fifth grade when it when it came out when Star Wars came out, and uh, when I saw Star Wars in space and how grand and you know it is, that's what got me into this field. And tell me. What is their crime? They are enemies of the Empire. I asked him about America, and he said he sensed a disturbance in the force. In the United States, we've always maintained uh, our scientific prowess, always looking, you know, tr investing in, in the future. Back in the 50s, uh, we invested in education, we invested in science, and, and we invested in the infrastructure of the United States. And that made us a great nation. We need to keep uh, that investment going in science. I've spent 15 years, you know, with the Tevatron operational. And so it is going to be very sad to see it go away. We have the, 
the, the shuttle fleet, you have radio astronomy, a uh, very large science project, uh, and you have the Tevatron uh, going offline. So three major science projects essentially come to a close this year. That's kind of, kind of disheartening. Final month of operation for a massive and sophisticated piece of scientific machinery. It is designed to help scientists understand by the power of the Tevatron to probe the building blocks of the universe. This is where the elusive top quark was discovered and where theories. I will be asking Helen to push this red button. Um, then, if you look at this display up here and you look at the red line, which matches the red button, um, you will end up seeing very quickly this thing go to zero. I've got four kids, the youngest of uh, my kids uh, wants to be a scientist someday, and I'm very concerned about the direction of science in America. I feel like we're losing that focus of basic scientific research. Well, the numbers seem to bear that out. It does, it does. So I came up with the trivial idea of celebrating this extremely important moment by pouring out a 40 here at Wilson Hall. You may have been the world's second most powerful photon antiproton accelerator, but you will always be the first in our hearts. Shut off the Fermilab uh, accelerator. That's another sign that America is fading from its uh, preeminence in so many fields. The Tevatron near Chicago, run by Fermilab, is being shut down, it's, which doesn't make much sense. Terminate the Tevatron's beam. As you can see on the red display, the line has gone to zero, so there is no longer any colliding beams of protons and antiprotons in the Tevatron. Today is also a special day because we hear two presentations from the two experiments, ATLAS and CMS, on their update on a search for a certain particle. On July 4th, 2012, CERN announced it had found a particle that looked a lot like the Higgs boson. Fermilab received credit for narrowing the search, but it was CERN that zeroed in on the particle. Well, I would like to add my congratulations to everybody involved in this tremendous achievement. Uh, for me, it's really an incredible thing that it's happened in my lifetime. It's taken... <laughs> There's still much work to be done to understand the Higgs and to chart other mysterious areas of physics, like dark energy, antimatter, and gravity, all realms that Fermilab continues to pursue without the Tevatron. But in 2012, the White House announced new cuts to Fermilab's budget, endangering many jobs, as well as much of the lab's new research. The cuts will also freeze plans to build Project X, America's next giant accelerator. I'd like to make a toast. This is a great day in physics. It doesn't get any better than this. This is the, the Higgs is the key to all of our theories. Here, here. And I wanted to add a thank you to all of you from Fermilab. I'm glad you were here. I really wanted this event to be friends and family. So um, it's nice to celebrate with all of you. Cheers. Cheers. Science doesn't care where it's done. The laws of physics are the same everywhere. But how and where will those laws be discovered? And who will be discovering them? And what will they gain? To Rob, this is another one of science's big open questions. I will go where the machines are. That's you know because I want to answer these questions that badly. So I will travel and, and be a science whore, if you will, and go wherever I can in order to do this physics. But that said, I'd much rather stay in the United States. We, we have a huge talent pool of successful people. We might as well bring the talent here and solve those questions rather than go elsewhere.